Welcome everyone to Spring 1944 tutorial. Hopefully this video can introduce new people to Spring 1944 and the Spring engine in general. This video is pretty long so it's divided into sections. The timestamps are in the description and it's also in the play bar of YouTube. Without further ado, let's get into the basics. Spring 1944 is a World War II RTS game focused on both gameplay and a little bit of realism. And this video is the complete basic tutorial for those who are looking to play it. Alright, to get started, where do I play this game? Basically, Spring is an open sourced RTS game that started from Total Annihilation and grew to be its own engine and has more games. Spring community can be rather small, but it's a very passionate one. I put the link to download Spring Lobby in the description and Spring offers much more games than just Spring 1944. So after you've made your account, all you need to do is go to the battle list on the top bar and search for Spring 1944. You can organize the list by games. However, I recommend playing a single player game first, just to get a hang of how the game works. But in order to play single player, you need to download the game and the map, which you can do by joining the multiplayer lobby. If you join the battle room of Spring 1944, you can download the game and the map automatically. However, for single player, I recommend a map called N Europe 7. It's really good for the Craig AI and it also works with Spammer. The AI will tend to follow the flags, so it almost simulates a player. The link to download the N Europe map is also in the description. All you need to do is put the map file on the maps folder of Spring. So, after you download the game engine and map, all you need to do is go to the bottom left corner of Spring Lobby, host new and choose the appropriate game with the appropriate engine, or else it won't work or crash, disable relay host and put as many players as you like. So, in the battle room, you can pick the map, which again recommend in Europe. Now, in the bottom right corner, you can click the add bot button and this window will pop up. The two AIs that works with Spring 1944 is Craig and Spammer. Craig is an AI that will try to play more like a natural player, but it will still use resources cheat to be able to compete with you. The Spammer on the other hand is the flag tower from Germany and it will spawn all units from all factions directly to you. It's more of a survival type of bot. You can rename the bot's name to however you like. You can also change its color and pick its side. And in order to manually select the spawns, choose before game. If you choose in game, the bot will not spawn at all because the bot will not choose its own spawn. Random and fixed will still spawn the bot but with the map's properties. Choosing before game allows you to manually put your spawn and the AI's spawn as well. When you hop into a match, there will be three bars in the top. The gray one in the left corresponds to your command, which is basically your money. The one in the middle represents your total ammo, and the one in the right is your resupply bar, which we'll talk about these two later. Keep in mind these bars might be different depending on the UI you chose. By pressing F11 in-game, you can disable and enable widgets. In this video, I use the Nota UI. So let's get into the basic economy the left bar. In order to receive more command, simply capture a flag with your infantry. The more infantry inside a flag, the faster they will capture it, with the exception for the Soviets. Soviet infantry does capture flags, but it's extremely slower compared to other factions. Instead, they use commissars, which are the basic engineers that the Soviets start with. Keep in mind that vehicles and mounted MGs Mounted few guns won't capture flags. You'll notice that when you capture a flag, the flag would change its color to the color of the capture, and the faction that the capture is playing will be displayed in the flag's pole. In the case of this video, I'm playing as the US, so the American flag goes up. The longer the capture flag stays under your control or the control of the enemy, the more command it produces over time, which leads the game to flow to minigame and late game technology naturally. You can see how much income the flag will provide by zooming in and looking on top of it. 
So generally speaking, economy comes from map dominance and most of the battles are gonna happen around these flags. The way that you spend your money is also a little bit different in spring. You still have fixed values like the 2000 command from the barracks, but that money is not spent instantly. Instead, what happens is that your money is slowly drained as the building is being done. Everything that consumes command has its own rate of consumption. The engineers, as you can see, making the barracks, it's only 15 from one engineer. But we need this barracks to be done faster, so we get another engineer to help. Now, the barracks is being done twice as fast, but so is our money being drained by 30 now. The idea of a good command balance is that you don't want to run out of command. So you want your income to be higher than your outcome, but you also don't want your command to excess. So, waste the command, but don't waste it too much to run out of it. By pressing H, you can give money to your allies that is stored from your bar. You can also share units and ammunition to your allies from the screen. When you run out of command, instead of stopping all production, your production will slow down. The more negative your income is, the slower your production will become. Also, don't worry about capturing more flags than your allies. Income is shared evenly between allies. In order to save more command and to reduce the outcome of your economy, you can use the weight command. The weight command can be used on builders and buildings. The weight command stops production, but it doesn't cancel it. So let's say you have a tank yard and a barracks working. However, you desperately need more soldiers. So you can press W to start the weight command on the tank yard, finish the barracks, and then press W to start the production of the tank again. Now that you understand a little bit of the basic economy, we need to talk about infantry. Because infantry is single-handedly the most important factor in every Spring 1944 game, with the exception of some naval maps. Infantry is considerably cheap, fast to make, and will support your vehicles with sight, which we'll talk about later. Capture flags, deal with other infantry and even deal with tanks themselves when they have the chance. Infantry is something you should have at all times, so you can just leave a barracks or your headquarters on loop if you like. But to talk about infantry, first we need to address the headquarters, so let's get into it first. Every faction, with the exception of the Soviets, will spawn with a headquarters. The headquarters is the most basic building you start with, However, it's the most important in the beginning. First thing you want to do is to build two free engineers before anything else, so that you can start building and keep pumping squads out of the headquarters at the same time. However, the important point here is that after you make those two three engineers, you keep making this tiny squadron of infantry all the time. This tiny squadron that leaves the headquarters can be considered underpowered, However, it is extremely cheap and fast to make, so if you give it time, your headquarters can make squadrons bigger than your barracks can. So it's a good idea to leave it the headquarters on loop. When you make your barracks, you will have a lot of more options, but you don't necessarily need to learn all of them right away. All you need to know is that make riflemen as much as you can. Riflemen is your backbone of pretty much your entire front line. The only exceptions that we're gonna talk about is the machine gun squad, the mortar squad, and the sniper squad, which require a more delicate approach to it. When in game, you're gonna encounter light machine gunners and heavy machine gunners. They both use the same icon, but heavy machine gunners can only fire when mounted and they are considered dicked in weapons. In order to mount MGs, First, that MG needs to be compatible. If it's an HMG and you see a yellow arc, that means that MG is deployable. Some machine gunners can fire unmounted, like the Germans and Americans. In order to mount that MG, select them and press deploy. You can hold shift, select the place where you want them to mount, and then press deploy while holding shift, aim whatever you want that MG to face, and then click again. That will make your unit automatically go there and mount itself up. Heavy machine gunners are great for stopping enemy infantry advancements. 
they can suppress infantry and that will slow them down and then because of their rate of fire they can pin units very easily too they have a very good amount of HP pool and the machine gunner squad comes with a scout every faction has a mortar squadron the mortar squadron will spawn three mortars and one scout the mortar has a great range advantage and can decimate groups of infantry very quickly mortars can also use smoke However, their smoke radius is much smaller when compared to a howitzer. The downside to mortars is that they are the only squadron who will require ammo. Each mortar stacks up to 150 of ammo, so after they leave your barracks and get resupply, that's 450 of ammo gone. And at the start of the game, you only have a thousand. So be careful not to run out of ammo in the beginning because of that. Even though snipers take as long as a rifleman squad, snipers rarely miss their shots and can kill any infantry with one shot. Mounted machine guns, mounted defenses will not die in one hit, but will be damaged significantly. Sniper is a great way to counter infantry that is very well equipped. For example, the British. The British headquarters will spawn brands non-stop. So a great way to counter those brands is to use snipers. Snipers will remain cloaked all the time, unless when a scout reveals them or when they shoot. Now please keep in mind, when advancing with infantry, always use the fight command. The fight command is basically the attack move in other RTSs. The fight command works with vehicle as well, but we'll get there. All you have to do is select your units, press F and then left click. Always draw a line to avoid splash damage from explosives. Retreating and when advancing with assault troops, it's usually the only time where you don't want to use the fight command. But because riflemen is the backbone of your infantry, you need them to stop in order to shoot. Because shooting when moving is very inaccurate and when they are in prone, if they are moving, they will not shoot. Another thing that you need to know about infantry, field guns, and aircraft is that they all have a mechanism called fear. While we will talk about field guns and aircraft later, the only thing that you need to keep in mind with infantry is that when infantry is shot, or high explosive shells, or sniper shots occur nearby, infantry will be suppressed and they will go instantly into prone. This will slow down the unit, but it will increase its defense. However, it won't increase the defense of aircraft and mounted defenses. Suppression is indicated by a yellow star under the health bar of the unit. If that star becomes red, that means they are in major fear. That unit will not respond to your actions and will stay there until it can leave that state. Vehicles don't get suppressed, so they don't use the fear mechanic. However, they can be pinned when a low caliber gun is used against them, mostly noticed when using anti-tank rifles. This is the part where we need to address the second and the third bar, the logistics. Any unit that uses explosives will require ammo, and all units that require ammunition will spawn without it. Fortunately, every building has a supply range of its own. You probably noticed already but it's the yellow ring made out of dots. These are what we call the supply zone slash range. Every unit that uses ammunition will have a yellow bar under their health bar. If you hover your mouse over that unit, on the bottom left corner you will have the tooltip. The tooltip will tell you how much ammo they can carry, how much logistics each shot will consume, and an overall total when their ammunition of the unit is full. In this side the supply range will automatically receive ammo that is stored from the second bar. The second bar represents your max ammo. If you do run out of ammo, the third bar will tell you how much time is left until the next resupply of ammunition. And you don't want your max ammo to draw below 50. Not 50%, but 50. Because any unit inside the supply range will now be receiving a 30% penalty in fire rate, represented by a gray plus circle. However, if you keep your max ammo always above the 50s, you receive a 30% fire rate bonus instead. When in supply zones. 
represented by a yellow plus circle. This rule applies to all units that are inside a supply zone, even if they do not use ammunition. This boost in fire rate can be a huge advantage to your infantry. In order to have more max ammo, build a storage shed. It's 4500 for all factions, but every faction has a different upgrade to it. But keep in mind, storage sheds are fragile and highly explosive, so it's better to keep them in the back. Every storage shed adds roughly a thousand of max ammo, and if they are built too close to each other, it can start a chain reaction. There are three ways you can supply your units in the front line with ammo. The first is the most basic, and it's trucks. You can deploy your trucks to an ammo supply. It has a fairly medium sized range, and you can undeploy it afterwards. The second method is to use a health track. Health tracks have a very small range of supply, but they are very mobile, and can support tanks that are raiding the enemy front lines. They are also great for flag raids. The third method, which is usually more related to mid game and late game, it's the large supply depot. Only cranes can build this, and this is the largest area of supply you can achieve, with the exception of Italy, which is a faction that the supply range of all instances are enhanced. Now let's talk about sight. Sight is something of extreme importance, both in the early game all the way to late game. If you hold shift over a unit, you'll see three circles. The red circle also appears when you start at the attack command, shows the range of attack of the unit. The green circle is the sight, spots infantry and vehicles alike. The purple circle on the other hand is the radar. In that area you won't see the enemy, but in the radar range you can see red blips that pop up like in radars and vehicle dusts. These are usually made from vehicles, buildings and hoasters. There are three ways you can clear the fog of war. The first and most simple is to just use infantry. The second is to use infantry and the vehicle scout. And the third is to use scout plane. The infantry scout is the binoculars guy. In the vehicle scout is usually a car or jeep. Both ground scouts are used in the same way. Select them individually and use the attack command. Always make sure that there is no objects or friendly units in the way. The scout plane, on the other hand, is much more powerful than both. It reveals a huge vehicle sight area in a medium-sized infantry sight area. However, like aircraft, it has a timer and it's the most fragile aircraft in the game. Now the last part that we need to talk about sight is smoke. Smoke can be used from mortars or hoiters. Hoiters are much better than mortars, but mortars can do the job just fine. Any unit inside the smoke will become very inaccurate. And if large amounts of smoke are used, like in the case of hoiters, their sight can be compromised as well. The last chapter of the basics is about vehicles. All vehicles will follow the same rules, however tanks are the best example for this. First thing you need to know is that the tank is divided in two sections, the first being the turret and the second being the hull. The armor values that are more on the bottom is for the hull. The ones that are more inner to the tank will be the turret. So how do I know this armor is good? To put it simply, when both of these numbers are higher, the better. But you can't be deceived by the low millimeter of the armor. For example, the Teki from the Japanese is only 14 millimeters, but because of the 72 degrees slope armor, that will usually go towards the 30 millimeter or even 40, depending on the angle of the shot. The angle of the shot is also counted towards this. When you shoot a tank and that tank is slightly deviated to the sides, there's a possibility that that will do no damage at all, because the tank was very well angled. This forces positioning on tanks to be very important, so you can exploit this. You can force your enemy to angle incorrectly. This is very easy to achieve when you have multiple tanks. But how do I know I can damage that tank with my tank? Well, if you select your tank 
and press A or the attack command, you can go within the range of attack of your tank and see how much millimeters you can penetrate. The closer the tank is, the better, but also more risky. With the exception of Italy, that has heat shells, which are not affected by distance. Now we get into the early game section. The following sections in this one will help you get started on your first games. Before anything, it's recommended that you play with a faction with strong infantry and balanced tanks. Great Britain, US, Germany are very good starters. Early game is the moment where you want to know quickly what faction you're going up against. That's when you can zoom in in the flags that the enemy is capturing and see what flag is going to be displayed. Sweden, USSR and Japan will usually tack towards tow gun yard more often. So prepare for mounted anti-tank guns and mounted field guns. In the case of the other factions, expect light vehicle competition. But going with the more easy starter factions, what you want to do is capture flags with your infantry, make two to three engineers on your headquarters, and make the headquarters squadron and leave it on loop to bring them on the front lines. With those engineers, make a light vehicle yard and build light vehicles to support your infantry. Keep the pressure on the flags and make a barracks if more infantry is needed. It's recommended you use your scout plane two to four minutes in. The scout plane is great to get information quickly. Send your scout plane to where you think the enemy spawn so that you can see the headquarters positioning and if they're attacking towards live vehicles or towed. Try to keep your scout plane alive. You will receive the money that the scout plane costs back if it survives. Early game phase can end quickly or take a little more time depending on the map you're at. Some maps will have economy which will rapidly increase and enter into a mid game in about 10 minutes, while others might take 20 minutes. Early game is very simple. As long as you keep countering the enemy and hold your lines and supply your units. However, when we get into mid game, tanks come into play. Tanks will work in the same way as light vehicles. Infantry will help them get sight, and in return, they will kill infantry and deal with other tanks. The difference here is that the penetration values will become harder, requiring multiple tanks to flank, or upgrading the tank yard for better tanks or upgrading the towed gun yard to tank destroyers. For your first games, it's recommended that you make a towed yard and upgrade it to tank destroyers. This is where scouts become very important. Use them to help your tank destroyers take care of the enemy tanks. And if you upgrade it into tank destroyers, if you have both the money and the ammo to sustain howitzers, you should definitely do them. Tank destroyers are only made from the upgraded towed gun yard with the exception from the US, that can make the Wolverine from the tank yard. Tank destroyers are fantastic tank killers. They only target vehicles, so they don't waste ammo on infantry and have great range. In counterpart, they are usually turretless, making combat on hills more difficult for them. They also don't have much armor to defend themselves and generally have a long reload. In their own way, they can be considered the sniper class of the tanks. In the late game, Enough money or ammo has been reached. This is where you can start really going to howitzers and aircraft together with your armada of tanks and infantry. In the late game, you want to continue producing medium tanks and infantry, tank destroyers, and keep using your scouts. But to break the tie, you want to get howitzers going, either to destroy the enemy's howitzers or to disrupt their infantry reinforcement. Don't use all howitzers with explosives. Mix them with smoke and explosive shells for maximum performance. Smoke will make sure you can safely advance and make enemy units miss their shots, while explosive shells will kill infantry in their radius. Howitzers will be inaccurate if they don't have sight. They can still shoot without clear view of the enemy when using the attack command, however. If the howitzer has sight of the target, it will start to target it. After a few shots, the following ones will have a precise accuracy. In the late game and even mid game, you can do aircraft. To do aircraft in the early game is a gamble. Aircraft is very expensive and will slow you down by a lot if you decide to do it early. In order to make aircraft, make a radar. Radar not only allows you to build your aircraft, but it will also detect incoming aircraft too. 
Going Anchorite has a very specific goal, to either destroy ground targets or to take down enemy aircraft. Every aircraft takes some time in order to get into the battlefield, to simulate reinforcement. And every aircraft has a timer, in order to simulate fuel. All factions have generally 5 aircraft squadrons. Interceptors, which arrive in 15 seconds, are inferior to fighters, but perfect for getting bombers that are unprotected. Fighters arrive in 30 seconds, your main use of air combat. They can easily go versus interceptors, fighters and bombers. Bombers arrive in 45 seconds. Bombers are designed to destroy buildings and they can also destroy tanks if needed. Ground attackers will also arrive in 45 seconds and they are specifically designed to destroy tanks. And lastly, the scout plane. This is the same scout plane from the headquarters and barracks, however, it is built much faster in the radar. Use aircraft to destroy valuable ground targets or intercept enemy's aircraft, and make sure they stay alive to get your command back. Great Britain and US, they have special landers. US has paratroopers, and Great Britain has gliders. And lastly, for the late game, heavy tanks. The purpose of heavy tank is to provide a tank that can press forward, survive a couple of hits and possibly deal with other medium tanks. Heavy tanks can be a menace. If no gun can penetrate it, aircraft or smoke might be the only solution. They generally have a long reload and are more expensive, so treat them carefully. Learning naval is pretty easy, because naval is straightforward. Make a barracks as quickly as you can and then make a boatyard truck. Move this truck to the deep waters and then deploy it. All factions have a fast torpedo boat, which currently don't actually have working torpedoes, an HE based boat and an AP based boat, an infantry lander and the two transport boats that you can make with engineers as well. And after upgrading the boat yard, you can unlock the long ranged boat and a tank lander. The reason why naval is straightforward is because of how the combat works. Boats that have no armor are going to be vulnerable to HE attacks. And boats that are armored will be vulnerable to AP attacks. Boat turrets that are manned and don't have any type of cover will be able to be suppressed just like infantry. Since boat turrets can be destroyed and boats have a large pool of HP, they will usually survive combat, however, you need them to go back into combat. So it's recommended that if a boat survives, or if you can retreat that boat in time, make a couple of engineers and use the repair command on a large radius, so that your engineers can repair both the boat and the tourist that has been destroyed. Getting good with naval comes with a lot of experience really. After you know all factions, cons and pros, you can easily dominate the seas. Thank you for watching, if you still have a lot of questions, don't be afraid to ask them on our battle room. There's also a wiki and a tutorial on the github page, so you can go there, it's also in the description. There's a shorter version of this tutorial, but it's very incomplete in comparison to this one. But then again, thank you for watching.